Bona tarda. Buenas tardes. Soy Ana Ramos, directora de la Fundación Mies van der Rohe. Y, y les agradezco a todos su presencia hoy aquí para hablar de cómo proyectar las arquitecturas icónicas hacia el futuro y en particular el papel de los espacios construidos en los museos en el siglo XXI. Eh, la excusa para hacer esto nos la da la Mies van der Rohe Haus de Berlín, conocida como Casa Lemke, que está en un proceso de plantearse una posible ampliación. I will, I will make some short introduction in Spanish and then go into English for you, my friends. Y porque antes de seguir, uh, quiero que sepáis que tenemos con nosotros a Wita Noak, directora de la Casa Lemke, o de la Mies van der Rohe Haus en la Casa Lemke de Berlín. Tenemos a Joachim Jagger, uh, subdirector de la Neue National Gallery de Berlín, que ahí acaba de pasar por un proceso de rehabilitación o de renovación de sus espacios y también de plantearse sus necesidades de crecimiento que han derivado en un nuevo proyecto de un edificio quizá icónico eh, a su lado. Tenemos también a Marguerita Guchone, directora del Maxi Arquitectura y directora científica del Grande Maxi en Roma. El Maxi es un proyecto, un edificio de, Mies, uh, de Zaha Hadid, los dos anteriores eran de Mies van der Rohe, este es de Zaha Hadid, uh, pero es un edificio que también está en un proceso de ampliación. Y lo han estado pensando y ha habido un concurso de arquitectura y es una historia que nos gustará que nos cuenten. Y Isabel Bach, uh, directora de arquitectura y de servicios generales del MACBA, aquí en Barcelona, que quizá os sea más familiar para todos, lleva tiempo inmerso en un proceso de planteamiento de crecimiento y una serie de retos que han tenido que superar por el camino. Y también seguro ha habido una reflexión profunda al respecto. Entonces, esta conversación abierta entre distintos museos de distintos tamaños, pero todos ellos magníficas arquitecturas europeas, es la que nos interesaba proponeros hoy aquí. De la mano de Semilla Banan, el que está comisariando todo el proceso Mies Goes Future, que es el proceso que la Mies van der Rohe House en Berlín ha empezado para mm, dar cobertura intelectual a, a su ampliación. Eh, estamos hoy aquí para conocer todas estas historias. El proyecto Mies Goes Future, luego Semilla Banan nos contará más sobre él. Nosotros mismos, el pabellón Mies Van der Rohe de Barcelona, tenemos limitaciones por nuestro espacio físico. Por ejemplo, ahora os tenemos que ofrecer esta pantalla de televisión con reflejos y limitaciones, cosa que si tuviéramos, según cómo, un espacio anexo al propio pabellón, a lo mejor podríamos tener un auditorio en mejores condiciones. Ese no es el debate de hoy, pero es una cuestión que también nos ocupa. Um, so I now go into English. I thank all our dear guests, uh, Wita Noak, thank you very much for being with us. Joachim Jagger, thank you very much for being with us. Margarita Guchone, grazie mille per essere qua. Muchísimas gracias, Isabel, per essere con nosotros. Um, I kind of made an introduction to our audience about why is this so interesting for us as a conversation. And now I give, uh, we will have a, uh, short interventions by each of our guests, uh, which will give you an overview of what's in their minds and in their hearts. And uh, then we will all together sit here and have a little talk about the future of architecture, museums, and so on. So please, Wita Noak, come to the floor.
Hello, everyone. Dear Anna Ramra, dear Anna, dear Margarete Buccione, dear Isabel Bax, dear Joachim Jäger, and dear Asenia, Asenia Benham. I'm grateful that all of us came together today to engage and share the responsibility of the institution we are responsible for and their future. Thank you to all of you for taking time out to come to Barcelona and especially a big thanks to Anna, Anna Ramos and her, her fantastic team for their amazing work they have done in preparation for this event and also the Zoom streaming on September 5th. Thank you to Greg and Asenia for their aus outstanding work they have done in the last two years for the project Mythos Future. Thank you also for the German Consulate and FSB. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I would like to introduce you to the history of the Haus Lemke and its special features in a very short and summarized form. The modest Lemke Haus may rightly be regarded as a perfect exa example of the essential quality of the work of the great 20th century architect Mies van der Rohe. The clients, the married couple Karl and Martha Lemke, imposed a low budget, budget on the project. As a result, Mies was able to demonstrate how, even for a fairly modest outlay and in a relatively sm small space, it was, it was possible to realize a high quality idea of modern living, albeit on a limited scale. In the case of the Lemke House, the main issue was to design a close link between architecture and nature. The design creates a smooth tran transition from the house into a large garden, the garden is itself melding almost seamless seamlessly with the Obersee Parkland. The wishes of the childless couple, Karl and Martha Lemke, had a big influence on the project. Karl Lemke was a qualified printer who, in 1925, along with the Jewish businessman Julius Bendix, founded Bendix and Lemke Graphic Art Establishment, to which the renowned Berlin printers Otto van Holten also belonged. Lemke specialized in the production of printed matter for art institution. Uh, 1929 advertisement show, showed Karl Lemke as a fashionable man with modern design principles. I quote, asymmetry contemporary printed matter works to express the rhythm of life in today's world. Lemke built up a small but a fine art collection, which after the couple's death was considered important enough to enter the collection of various Berlin museums. Berlin's Kunstgewerbe Museum received a small valuable collection of clocks and the furniture designed by Mies, a small group group of uh, five paintings by 15th and 16th century German and Dutch painters was donated to the Gemälde Gallery and the Max Pechstein painting Neues Haus was left to the Brücke Museum. In February 1932, Karl Lemke met Ludwig Mies van der Rohe then director of the Bauhaus for the first time to discuss his new building for project for a small modest house. After Karl Lemke and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe had finally come to an agreement, planning permission was granted in July 
and so their contract between Marta Lemke, the official client, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was signed. A sum of 22,000 Reichsmark was agreed in the architectural contract. The house was built relatively quickly. In April 1933, Karl and Martha Lemke were able to move in. The single story house has an L-shaped ground plan, a flat roof and a plain facade. The three main living rooms of the houses of the house face south and west. In the three living spaces, the um, 38 square meter living room. Oops. Uh, 28 meter square meter living hall and the 30 square meter bedroom. The floor to ceiling windows are oriented towards the lake and garden and grouped around a ground level terrace laid with Vesa sandstone. stone. The service rooms, the boudoir, pantry and kitchen. Um, protect the living areas behind them. All the living spaces are 280 meters high. Access to the house is by a brick driveway leads directly to the garage. <coughs> the furnishing of the interior of the house uh, of the Lemke House was also carried out by Studio Mies van der Rohe and planned down to the smallest detail. The furnishings were designed in cooperation with Lenny Reich, the head of weaving at Bauhaus and at that time Mies partner. The Lemke Garden was designed by Förster Hammerbacher Matern team in Förster's office in Potsdam Bornheim in 1933. Mies van der Rohe and Förster had already worked together, for example, on the gardens for House Riel, 99, um, the first project by Mies, and House Urbig on the Griebnitzsee in Potsdam Babelsberg. In the Lemke House, the last residential building he built in Europe, Mies rewired his love for one of the oldest of building materials. The house was the last of a series of brick building he designed in Europe, among them the brick country house project, the Wolf House in Gobin, 25, the monument to the November Revolution in Berlin Friedrichsfelde, 26, and the two res residences built for the silk manufacturers Esters and Lange in Krefeld. It is true that in case of the Lemke House, the brick was also chosen for reasons of economy. However, in treating it was a fundamental element of structure, Mies demonstrates how it was possible to transpose the simple ancient building material into the modern age. As the smallest unit of construction, the bricks proportion are reflected in the cubic structure of the house itself. The Lemke House Mies van der Rohe designed an unassuming masterpiece, a modest home for the modern minded man. In spite of the, its modest scale, the house has a certain nobility. It is so simple and unpretentious that it hardly seems to be special at all. However, it is precisely the concentration on the self evident, the essential, and the necessary 
that make this house as a prime example of classical modernism. The openness to nature, the attention to detail, the feeling of for proportion and the balancing of contrast through, through the radical clarity of its architectonic language show that for me, even in the case of his modest residence, it was about more than pure functionality. And it is this more, this, uh, the spiritual dimension to be found in Mies buildings which continues to fascinate to this day. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the house became public in 1990. The focus of the house lies in organizing exhibitions by contemporary international artists in the dialogue to the architecture of house. Each year we work with individual topics that concentrate on Mies van der Rohe, the modernist culture, and the house itself. itself. It's an overall staging of exhibition, symposia, guided tours, and education. We also do Mies research. For this, we have launched our own series of public publication. We honor Mies by making the program program lively and demanding. Today we have 25,000 visitors a year. Everyone is happy and stay in, stays in the house and garden for a long time. The press celebrates the house, the artists love it. Due to the success story of the house, we are facing a new challenge today. To relieve the house, we need a visitor center. We need more space for our visitors. As in any modern museums, we need a coffee and a bookshop. We currently have too little space for events, workshops, and talks. We need offices for our team. But the most important, the most important we want to free the small house from the affairs of the institution. We want 100% means. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vita. That was a very inspiring uh, presentation of uh, the building and the problem you, you are facing now. So now I would like to ask the Deputy Director of the Neue National Gallery in Berlin, Joachim Jäger, to tell us about this other very different Mies building in Berlin. So please, Joachim. Yeah. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and also good evening, uh, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very pleased. Thank you, Anna and Vita, for this wonderful invitation, for the idea to speak about the future of these architectural icons. Um, please excuse that I cannot speak in Spanish or Catalan. I will have a little speech in English and I try to touch two buildings. How can architecture icons be transferred into the future? We all here obviously share the same basic question. In my case, the idea of a museum and specifically the idea of an art museum has fundamentally changed. They are no longer places just to look at art. They are social places with a wide range of functions. They are places to gather, places to meet friends, to enjoy readings or lectures, to attend concerts like here, places to use Wi-Fi or places to do research, or they are just cool public places to hang around. So a museum is much more than just a museum. But the question is well posed. How can you reach this new idea of a museum? How can you create social spaces if your museum is a famous landmark building with restrictions and limitations everywhere? So I'm pleased to speak about the Berlin situation and I'm going to speak about two buildings. Um, the Mies van der Rohe building, of course, um, and the new building next door, the Herzog and Demerau building 
um, which is under construction now. Those buildings will be dedicated to the art of the 20th century. Those buildings should be, in our eyes, more than just ordinary traditional museums. The Mies building, as everybody is probably aware, has just undergone a thorough refurbishment. And the Herzog Dimmerau building is almost completed in its planning and is being under construction now and will open in the year 2027. So the two main questions of tonight, what is a museum and what would a museum need for the future, were already discussed in 2010 when we started the process for the refurbishment of the Neue Nationalgalerie. Now the Neue Nationalgalerie is reopened, has also a nicely image, is reopened one year ago, last August. Thousands of visitors came to check what remained from the original icon, what has changed or altered. Most people were afraid that something was lost or that the museum was not working anymore because it may have been trapped sort of in a landmark protection system that it became an icon only and not a good museum anymore. But now, after a year of working with this Mies, we can proudly say the refurbishment has been a full success. It not only brought back the formal qualities of the original architecture, it also still works as a museum. And the main reason for this success was to convince the landmark conservators to make alterations in the building possible, to adjust this old-fashioned Rolls-Royce to the needs of a contemporary traffic. To stay within the image of a noble car, we did not only need new gears or new motors, we needed different doors, different seats, different lights, better sound, more comfort zones, more space for the kids, more space for the luggage, these things. And I only can give a few examples here. Of course, we exchanged all technical machines and devices in the building, the light system, the whole air condition system, the fire protection system, etc. But so simple things like wardrobes were a huge, is were a huge issue. Mies had just offered very small wardrobes, and I'm showing them here upstairs small ones, these are the original ones. So what can you do in a historic landmark building? The only possible solution was to change the floor plan on the lower level. The architects convinced everyone, including the landmark protection department, to move the art storage from inside the building towards outside to a new spot under the terrace. By that move, they were able to transfer the former storage area into a space for larger wardrobes and you see it here. To make this shift visible, they altered the ceiling in the new added space. The re they removed the underhang ceiling, showing the blank concrete of the, buildings, of the building, making everyone aware that this space is not original, has been altered. I think this is a good example for a solution, how one could deal with an old building to make it kind of fit for the future. And I give you another example, which is kind of tricky, this is the ceiling and the light system. Of course, we needed spotlights in the gallery level and, suggest and suggested to include light rails into the ceiling. This brought us into a big discussion because this means to lose the original grid for the ceiling. You see that here. But we felt it was absolutely necessary to go this step to make a contemporary display in the galleries possible. And I show it you um, here. Um, an exhibition shot from our current exhibition, Art of Society, where we were able to install a rather flexible light system which allows curators also in future to work in different light moods and atmospheres. And just two more images about what we did with the building. We found also a solution for the cafeteria, which is located inside the building without any natural light which became an own work of art and installation because we invited Jorge Pardo to develop a wall decoration and light system, and by that we were able to transform this kind of inattractive space into an attractive space. And we developed a new style system for the building and for all merchandising. Uh, we, were, we were very impressed, Anna, what you have established here, the pavilion, and we saw that a couple of years ago and took um, this design line as a model, as a role model also to work for a style for Berlin. But, and now comes the big but, Mies stays Mies. 
The Neue Nationalgalerie is still a very traditional museum, especially in its attitude. Far away from an open contemporary way of life, there is no laissez-faire, there is no informal life. The architecture is impressive. Many people admire the building, but of course there is always this moment of overwhelming and intimidation. So already 10, 15 years ago, when we started the renovation, we saw strong limitations in this building. Our concern was, to say it here in three words, the temple, the carpet, the grid. The temple idea of the museum is a problem because the whole aspect of art admiration is, totally is a totally wrong approach for art after 1960. Art of the 1960s is pop and performance, is an art of participation, provocation, inclusion. Just see a work like Body Pressure by Bruce Nauman, a work which has to be performed by visitors, a work where visitors themselves become part of the work. It is a huge contradiction to show such a work within the concept of a modern temple or the carpet. The carpet is a problem because it is too loaded with history. Every sculpture you place on it becomes an interaction with Nice or the era of the 1960s. And the grid, especially in the lower level, and I'm showing here the floor plan, actually the new floor plan, but it's stays more or less the same, with the exception of the new storage area outside. And the grid, especially in the lower level, is a problem. It is too limited and it establishes too much order. We would need more open spaces. Here, for instance, you see a film installation by Joan Zonas, a major performance artist of the 1960s. How could you shoot such a film work, for instance, within this grid? It's not possible. And there are no spaces for education. So we have to go outside with school classes and kids to do workshops, not an ideal situation. And finally, of course, there is a huge collection of art of the 20th century, which we can only show in small portions. So almost right from the beginning, when we worked on the refurbishment of Nice, it became clear we need another building. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Yeah, it's much easier to say what we do not like in a building than what we do like. And yeah, very interesting also the eternal controversial point between architects and museum directors. We, know, we all know each other since long time. <laughs> so uh, thank you, very interesting. Now um, I will uh, give the floor to the director of uh, architect, no, to, to, sorry, to Margarita Guccione, who's director of Maxi Arquitectura and scientific director of Grande Maxi in Rome. Margarita hablará in italiano. She will speak in Italian, and later we will have a translation of her words into English, so our guests can follow it. Okay, so thank you, Margarita. Good evening, sorry, I don't speak English, I speak in Italian. Grazie, grazie. Thank you very much, Anna Ramos, for the invitation and opportunity to present here the expansion project that we have come to call Grande Maxi. Ampliamento del Maxi di Roma, che abbiamo chiamato Grande Maxi. This is the maxi that was designed by uh, Hadid in 1999 and it's totally rooted and embedded in the Roman skyline. It was an innovative building that seemed rare at the beginning uh, according to the historical and natural heritage of the city but that it really fit very well. Here we have a closer look at the big building that was uh, designed by Hadid and we see in the first place the big square that has become increasingly important for the city and for the cultural project. Here we have the Grande Maxi master plan that redesigns the incomplete, incomplete areas of the museum and it expands the cultural project with the new functions and ideas of the Grande Maxi of the future.
Sostenibilità, innovazione, inclusione. Queste sono tre parole chiave che hanno, diciamo, ci hanno permesso di Here we see the three keywords are sustainability, innovation and inclusion, the three keywords that have allowed us to design the master plan. And it's all based on the idea that we need a new maxi, a maxi that has accumulated a treasure of 12 years since its opening, and we have to tap into that. Maxi is not only a traditional museum anymore that collects, preserves and exhibits, but there's a new whole range of activities that have to do with experience and with the artistic production, an intellectual one. Ursula von der Leyen, che peraltro è stata uh, al Maxi. So we have been working on the idea of the new European Bauhaus that was promoted by Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen and we were thinking that in the current post-pandemic times it is more the, we need more than ever a depth of thinking, a depth of creativity go, dating back to the Bauhaus of the 1900s. Cinque linee di intervento che ora vi descrivo brevemente che intervengono sulla materia fisica. We have basically five work streams proposed that will have an impact on the physical museum but also on the cultural project. La prima prevede un intervento in un'area laterale eh, numero uno. Number one, it's an intervention on the site and it will involve the building of a new building that will become an R&D hub, an experimentation hub open for artists, architects, professionals because it's always interesting to us to understand the um, linking of different disciplines, among them um, AI. Nel nuovo edificio quindi ci sarà uh, un laboratorio, un polo di ricerca e di sperimentazione con una particolare attenzione al restauro del contemporaneo, il, il restauro dell'antico e un'eccellenza tutta italiana, ma sul tema del restauro dell'arte e dell'architettura contemporanea c'è molto da fare e i maxi si candida essendo molto... The new building will include uh, a research and ex experimentation lab and hub and it will be uh, very... it will focus on the restoration on comp contemporary art and architecture because maxi is very proud of being a museum of architecture and art and the new building will expand also the storage space that we so much need today, but it will do it in a very innovative way, including a new museum gallery that will um, exhibit a different function to the works that we preserve. The new building will include also um, special training spaces for museum professionals, which is a very important topic to us. L'altra azione riguarda la creazione di un sistema di verde che eh, ridisegna la fascia eh, lungo la via Masaccio. La, we will la also la create a, one green system, a, a band, a green band going along via Masaccio, that is the uh, road that goes in parallel on the other side of the current gates. It will be an urban green space for the city. Uh, it will not have only decoration purposes, not at all, but we aim to create a micro ecosystem to have an impact on the quality and comfort of those people who will enjoy the public space and for the district. The green space will include um, exhibits, will include veggie gardens and pedagogical gardens, but we will go back to the initial idea by Hadid that did not include this front line, but it envisaged the entry to the museum at the center of the square che non prevedeva un fronte e un retro, ma che appunto considerava l'ingresso al maxi nel centro della piazza. Uh, the third work stream is called Maxi Energy and aims to turn the building into a sustainable building because it's a building that was conceived back at a time when sustainability was not um, a hot topic and it consumes a lot of energy. 
e qui si pone il problema del rapporto con Unicona perché tale è diventato l'edificio di Zadid, tra l'altro uno degli edifici più rilevanti per lo sviluppo della sua carriera. So here comes the problem when you deal with an iconic building like this one that was an, one of the most iconic buildings for Hadid in her career and of course we will try to experiment with the state of the art PV technology to avoid altering the architectural cover of the building. Stiamo sperimentando delle tecnologie molto avanzate che ci permettono di ricoprire con un sistema fotovoltaico. Uh, looking for and experimenting with state of the art technology to use and end up with a PV system to cover the structural architecture, uh, architectural elements of the building with panels and the aim is to reduce the energy consumption by, by at least 40%. Pensiamo di coinvolgere anche il vicinato, che in questo caso il numero 3 è una... We are also thinking about um, involving uh, the neighboring uh, institutions. Uh, we have a military barracks um, next door and we are planning to share the consumption reduction with them. La quarta linea si chiama appunto legata all'accessibilità, eh, al miglioramento e all'abbattimento delle barriere architettoniche, ma anche a ripensare alle modalità di accesso. The fourth work, work stream um, focuses on accessibility. We aim to improve or basically eliminate architectural barriers and we also want to deal with the access to the cultural content of the museum, uh, taking into account a varied audience, taking into account the disability, um, deaf people, blind people, but also those with a social barrier to the content to make it accessible to everyone. L'accessibilità naturalmente riguarda anche il tema dei depositi che come dicevo prima eh, vanno ripensati nei Accessibility in this case will be implemented in the storage spaces too. They will be rethought in Hadid's building they were in the basement and in the new building they will, will be accessible and visitable. L'ultima linea è un upgrade tecnologico che riguarda la disponibilità appunto di eh, sistemi digitali che permettano di gestire and the last work stream has to do with te technology we will have availability of different digital systems for the management of our audience of the visitors but they, they will be offered to artists as new tools for the creation of their works and for the enjoyment of those Naturalmente questi interventi avranno una ricaduta su quest'area di Roma che è un'area molto significativa per l'architettura del Novecento. Abbiamo vicine le opere di Nervi, il palazzetto lo sport e lo stadio Flaminio. Obviously this intervention will have an impact on the surrounding area. This is a very relevant area of Rome due to its architecture. We have uh, different landmark buildings that by Nerdi, we have a palazzo, we have an auditorium, there's the Tiber and the Foro Italico complex and the project uh, includes a strategic regeneration of the district. Siamo partiti nel febbraio del 2022 con un concorso internazionale di idee per le prime due linee di intervento, la realizzazione del nuovo edificio di servizio. We started in February 2022, we launched an international competition for ideas for the new building and for the design of the green area. Concorso, queste sono, sono le quantità che, che abbiamo messo eh, a bando con le funzioni. Eh, abbiamo fatto we, well, you saw the figures of the competition in the previous slide and in this one we, we conducted a preliminary study to look into the relations and the factions of the current museum and the next expansion. Il concorso si è concluso con 103... Eh, Competition has been uh, finished. We received 103 projects. There were five awarded shortlisted projects and there's a winning project that I will show you in a minute. Dico ancora che il progetto è stato finanziato su fondi del Ministero, con fondi del Ministero delle Infrastrutture nell'ambito, diciamo, del metodo PNRR. The project has been funded uh, by the Infrastructure Ministry through a program that we have, PNRR, and therefore we are forced to have uh, deadlines, very stringent deadlines. The planning phase will go to 2023 and it has to be completed between 24 and 26. We are highly optimistic in Italy. 
il progetto che ha vinto e che appunto svilupperà la, la progettazione, era un concorso di idee, è un progetto di un gruppo italo-francese, eh, vedete qui i nomi dei, dei progettisti. Con, ehm, so um, the project, the winning project is from an Italian French group um, with uh, Basnet, who is a landscape arch artist and uh, the architects, and it convinced both the uh, commission of the competition and Maxi because of its quality, its architectural quality. It's not a challenging project with um, Hadid's original building, but rather a very efficient one. Un edificio che costituirà la, la testata no, del, del sistema lineare di verde, demineralizzerà, non so come riuscire a tradurlo, Toglierà il cemento dalla piazza per rendere il suolo um, The main building that will be presiding over the green uh, system uh, will aim also to remove concrete from the square to, so that the soil becomes permeable and we can create a microclimate to reduce the temperature of the surrounding area by two to three degrees. It will be all in all a very efficient and consistent project uh, with the philosophy of the museum and we are highly optimistic that it will be implemented according to the deadlines. Ecco, questo è un dettaglio del progetto di Basmet che poi eh, si allarga alle aree circostanti. Sempre di più il museo è un soggetto attivo. Here you have a more detailed um, view of this project by Basnet that is expanded into the surrounding areas. The native subject, the, the main center, is the museum, of course. The triangle at the bottom is another artistic project that we want to involve. And later on we will move, move on with the other interventions that aim to regenerate the green areas of the city. Grazie mille Margarita, thank you very much. So Berlin, Rome and now Barcelona. So Ms. van der Rohe, uh, Zaha Hadid and now uh, Richard Mayer. We are very pleased to have with us someone who's not only the director of architecture at Magba, but was one of the architects involved of the reconstruction of this uh, Barcelona pavilion back in the 80s. So please, Isabel Vax, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much, uh, the Pavilion, the Foundation of the Pavilion, uh, to allow me to share this conversation about the two questions that fashion me for a long, long time in my life, which are yeah, art and architecture. And secondly, I thank you so much to allow me to speak in my language, which is Catalan. Thank you, and please uh, forgive the, lang the length. Uh, okay. Uh, my presentation tries to be. Oh, excuse me. La meva presentació vol ser una. So my presentation will be a series of snapshots. So I ask you for your mercy because some of the periods will not be described in detail. But I think it's needed to have a historical overview of the museum. And others, but I think it's necessary to give an explanation historical de la situació del museu i de l'entorn en el que es produeix el museu. Bé. Uh, primer, una referència uh, al barri Okay, um, so I want to focus on the district first. It's the Raval district, up, you see it on the map there. It's been historically very dense. It was built within the walls of the city and it has historically had a deterioration of the real estate of the building stock. This is a vision that makes reference to the GATPAC. The GATPAC was a movement to the Second Republic in the years aquí estan al 1936 i va provocar va provocar va fer una reflexió molt seriosa i higienista al voltant This refers to Gatapak which was uh, this took place in the Second Republic in Spain it was a serious reflection about the notion of the city and just like Le Corbusier exactly Passo molts anys de cop uh, arribem al 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 passem de llarg cap a la dictadura i arribem a la presència de la democràcia amb, els primers, amb les primeres propostes de reflexió de renovació del barri 
So we skip the dictatorship and we come to democracy in Spain and here we come to the first proposal to regulate uh, the Raval, the district. It's a well-known plan for the locals. It's called From the Liceo to the Seminario. El Liceo és aquesta zona d'aquí, és aquest edifici d'aquí, i el que proposava aquest pla és un recorregut independent del recorregut. So the Liceo is that uh, part over there, uh, it's an independent itinerary, basically it aims um, through recognition and drawing, it aims to recognize precisely the heritage of the city and the public spaces, encouraging the city to occupy them again. Torno a saltar en el temps. Uh, I faig una comparada. A l'esquerra, el que proposava de fet una evolució del Liceu al Seminari i a la dreta l'encàrrec que es va fer a Richard Mayer. Here we have a comparison. On the left we have an evolution of the Liceu to the Seminary itinerary. On the right there's Richard Mayer's project and there's the project also and you can see the differences. Richard Mayer's project was chosen thanks to his prestige in the world of architecture. A l'esquerra veiem una proposta historicista que a partir d'un edifici existent, que és aquest d'aquí, allarga a tota la illa la presència... On the left we have a very stylish proposal that aimed to expand from the building to the whole block. It demolished the part and it also proposed a green area in the area where we have the university today. I a la dreta tenim la proposta de Richard Mayer en un edifici col·locat en el centre d'un espai, diguéssim, que prèviament era prou dens, que s'ha fet un buit. Here we have um, Richard Meyer's proposal with the building at the center. It has a very important presence for the district and it has the square in the forefront and some intermediary spaces. Bé, uh, Mayer va triar el lloc, per tant, ell... La posició de l'edifici és volguda al lloc d'un recorregut que va fer per la ciutat i va triar el lloc de la mateixa manera i se situa de la mateixa manera que el projecte... So, Mayer himself chose the location of the building in his itinerary through the city. It's closer to the proposal of the smaller project of applied art, so it's a truly Mayer building. He de dir que ningú es pot sorprendre de resultat de l'edifici, de la presència i de l'arrogància d'alguna manera d'aquesta arquitectura enfront a l'espai. So no one can be surprised at the outcome, at the building and its presence and the way it occupies space. It was a very long construction and it sparked the interest of the city. Uh, we have a picture of the open day and there were very long queues of people queuing up to enter the building for the first time. Parlo una mica perquè hi ha un període, diguéssim, a partir de la inauguració del museu. El museu comença a construir... So, um, the opening of the museum took place in 1995. The construction went from 1989 or 90 to 1995. And I'll talk now about a long period, but briefly, and I want to talk about the content of the museum. Um, I he triat dues exposicions o dues mostres d'una exposició, una, una exposició a, les, a la dreta, i una obra concreta d'una altra exposició, que el que cerquen és una de les preocupacions que va moure el museu en aquells primers anys. Davant de la presència d'un arquitecte o d'una arquitectura tan potent i tan... I want to, I have chosen two samples, uh, well, an exhibition on the one hand and a piece of an exhibition that uh, both reflect very well the concern that the museum had at the time because faced with such powerful architecture, the museum felt the need to influence the building itself. And in the exhibition that was entitled Gazes, we tried to build a bridge with the district, with the surrounding neighborhood. And it was meant to be a corridor that was coming from an exhibition space into the the building, but that was uh, not possible. It had been the initial intention, though. On the left, a exposition of architecture that reflected not only on the own edifice, but also on the entorn of the edifice. And it was invited to this group of architects, Vicente Guallar and Valeria Herrero, who are here, who are here, who are here, who are here, who are here. So, the architecture exhibition basically wanted to reflect on the surrounding area. Different architects were invited to take part, architects from Valencia, from Madrid, from Brad, and then MBRD. The general proposal was a very general one. They had different interventions on the square to propose, and you can see the wedding 
la chava resulta ser LDB. Bé, això és la proposta, és a dir, el dibuix que es va presentar, que consistia senzillament en pintar al terra pistes esportives. Això va ser... So at the top, you, well, you had before the sketch that was presented. It was basically a proposal to draw sports grounds on the floor, and the district was really excited about it. Everyone was playing around on the streets. They would take turns to play on the different sportive uh, grounds. And once the exhibition was over, we didn't dare to dismantle the whole thing, and the city council established a series of sports grounds in the district. Bé, però no tot van ser, diguéssim, propostes exteriors. Ara faig un flash ràpid a través del que són les imatges més tradicionals, d'un museu, és a dir, d'un museu que té una vocació de... Um, not all of them were external proposals. The museum has always had this calling uh, to present objects and for many years the visitors had been spectators and not uh, players or actors. I a més, un tipus d'art que no s'explicava més que per referències a ell mateix, que era... And including a kind of art that was self-referencing and which meant that parallel explanations were not admitted. Tothom entén quan es parla de gentrificació. És a dir, quan hi ha zones arreu que estan deteriorades o que estan abandonades, s'ha produït al llarg de diferents llocs les inversions o el capital que intenta fer pujar de valor aquests... In parallel, and that's not a conclusion to what I've said so far, we had to go back to the times where we were witnessing what was going on in Europe and in the world, and I'm talking about gentrification here, because there were worn down areas everywhere that were attracting investment and capital to try and revalue those areas. This happened in Venice, in London, in the Lower East Side, and across the world. He de dir que això és un dels fenòmens que ha passat en el Raval. En el Raval el que s'ha produït és diverses coses. Una d'elles, un efecte de crescuda de preus i, per tant, d'expulsió de determinada gent que està... So this has happened in the Raval district too. Many things have had happened at once. There was an increase in prices, which meant that people were expelled from the neighborhood. And the whole tourism of the city basically meant that it occupied the square, which is one of the very few ones in the district, for activities that could not coexist with others. És a dir, que en aquests casos, i no passa només a Barcelona, passa a molts llocs, el que és més habitual és que, evidentment, la gent protesta perquè se sent expulsada dels llocs on viu, però el que fa és visibilitzar... And in these cases, not only in Barcelona, but everywhere, people protest and basically visibility focuses on the public institutions or characters. People do not delve into the problem, and in this case, the MACBA was... I tirem un altre cop una mirada a lo que és l'objecte del museu, que és l'art. I és entendre una actitud que des del punt de vista d'un director... And here we go back to the museum object, which is art after all, and it's about looking back and looking into the art movements that have historically protested when faced with these situations, and we can find more friendly ways to deal with those. Tots aquests artistes, des de Hans Hacke fins a Martha Rosler, fins a Bodisco, o en el col·lectiu... We have a series of artists who have basically reflected the social concern and they have used specific artistic attitudes to confront precisely financial powers. Bé, i aquest és l'entorn en el que es planteja el museu amb aquesta voluntat de reconèixer més... It's turned, it's turned that, that way, okay. Well, I'll try to, try to, 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 to face it in, 
Okay. Uh, aquí está el museo. Uh, here's the museum. I tried to speak in English because two, two questions. One, the position, and second, the language is too much. <laughs> and then, here's the museum. Uh, here is uh, uh, CCCB, which is uh, Casa de la Caridad, which is you know, the center of contemporary uh, and urban uh, <coughs> exhibitions. Uh, here is uh, the university, the, a private university. Here is a public university. And finally, these are the convent by Ganges and, of course, the Meyer building. Uh, we have to recognize from the Meyer, you know, or from, from the Magra, our responsibility to do something to change the position of the building and to, to, to dialogue with the communities in, an, in the proposal of the enlargement. For our enlargement, the city council have proposed uh, this shape, which is the corner of the Convent by Ganges. Bueno, torno a català, eh? <laughs> Finalment. Bé, la proposta eh, respon a un concurs, a una competició pública. Eh, es presenten bastants... Bastant, eh, era molt restrictiva, he de dir que era un concurs molt exigent, perquè demanava molta... So, uh, these all resulted in a public competition, a very stringent one, because a lot of experience was demanded from the candidates and many projects uh, were received, and finally a temporary um, company made up by eight architects, which are local architects with a focus on sustainability, and a Swiss um, architecture study in charge of the Swiss History Museum were the winning project. I el projecte guanyador va ser aquest, amb un jurat compost per 21 persones eh, eh, amb tres sessions diferents. The jury was made up by 21 people who met three times and 20 of them unanimously agreed that this was the winning project. Um, tornem una altra vegada a fer, a recapacitar, perquè quan un comença, quan un, quan un projecte o quan un edifici dedicat a l'art comença una nova singladura, so when an art project starts a new or embarks on a new adventure, such an, uh, an enlargement, it's uh, mandatory for them to think about the surrounding problems, to establish a dialogue with citizens, and that's what we have started to do in this development towards construction. For one side, the new edifice antes que encara que l'edifici Mayer tingui un mur cortina que sembla que està molt obert i molt friendly respecte de la plaça, no és veritat, perquè aquest mur cortina està bloquejat per, una, per la posició de les rampes d'accés i per tant el museu es veu obligat a mirar cap a dins. Aquesta és una de les primeres coses. I la segona, aquestes reflexions que són, diguéssim, reflexions que... Eh, and on the other hand, well, even if the Maya building seems to be open uh, to the square through this curtain that we see, it's not actually the case because it is um, basically blocked by the ramps, by the access ramps. And the second one are these reflections that you have on the slide, uh, that the museum has to overcome history, it has to be in dialogue, it has to become a shelter, and it has to reinvent itself. Per entendre, ara aquesta és la posició bona, diguéssim, l'altra està de girada. Aquest és l'edifici Mayer. He agafat alguna de les imatges del concurs que van presentar els arquitectes. I've taken some images that were submitted to the competition and they include precisely that itinerary that I showed you before from the Liceo to the seminary and they all have exactly the same will which is to draw the public buildings for the city to understand them and occupy them and that links up beautifully with a very Barcelonian tradition which was to precisely to understand and link the city through the churches or the public uh, buildings. En el centre veieu la planta baixa de l'edifici i a la dreta eh, una visió de l'interior de lo que dona nom al projecte que és la galeria, que és aquest espai lineal que hi ha aquí davant. Això és una visió 
we have at the center the ground floor and to the right you, we have the space that um, is the title to the project. There's the whole backyard surrounding the apse of the landmark building and the museum offers uh, those spaces, the gallery and the apse area as public buildings to the city. És una façana que vol ser, vol rematar i vol donar unitat al conjunt que s'ha fet a trossos. So here we have an image of the uh, building that will be the enlargement of the museum. The facade aims to represent the different parts of a whole and what we offer not only to the district but to the city is that the two level square will include a third level, the terrace that will become, is being designed as a garden and it will be um, visible beyond the opening hours of the museum. No voy a alargarme més perquè podria explicar-vos el edifici nou com és, però ja tindrem ocasió. Només volia tornar a l'origen i tornar a una cosa que has dit, Joaquim, que és de caràcter de building. So I don't want to take up more time. I just want to go back to the origin and to something that Joachim said that we need to work on, and that is that um, it's not about designing a usage plan. It's about working together so that we achieve the right attitude for the building and what the MACBA needs to do is to be in dialogue with people. Isabel, we go now to the second part, uh, uh, which uh, we, we are quite ahead of time, so we will have to make it shorter. I would ask uh, Joachim, Wita, and Margarita to sit in uh, four of the stalls, and I would ask uh, Esenilla to tell us about what is this Mies Go's future project. And uh, so, yeah, please, Esenilla, come to the Everyone, thank you so much for being here. By you being here and engaging in this dialogue, you're part of the Meet for Future project. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit when my screen is on. There we go. Meet for Future. Um, just to tell you, I will be saying a lot of we and a lot of us. By we, of course, I mean Vita and um, other protagonists who participated in this project. It's not just me. And uh, my partner in crime, Greg Bannon, who made all the films, he's an American film and um, artist and filmmaker. So this is we, and um, so again, thank you so much for participating in this we. When Vita Nog invited me to be the curator of this project, Meet for Future, um, because as you um, heard now, is that her wish is to have a new building beside the historical landmark where people can gather, exchange ideas, and art becomes more just looking at paintings or artworks on the wall, but it's about social engagement. So I thought, well, you can't not really have one exhibition with this title, me, such a historical person, goes future, such an optimistic idea, and so, you know, so far out. So. So I'm gonna go for two seconds, I'm gonna go a little bit to the history because for me, in order to respect this project and respect the name of Miss, I had to dive a little bit into the archives which are at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was Miss explicit wish to have his entire archive at the MoMA, which is for MoMA very unusual, they only have one another archive by Frank Lloyd Wright. And by looking through those drawings and really observing, I really fell in love with this, with this gentleman whom I never met and his drawings because they're very childlike, they're very whimsical, and they're very understandable for all of us. And if you look at this drawing, you can see that the original layout of the Haus Lemke has two, um, two addresses, which means it's designed or it's meant to be two spaces 
Um, and Lemke actually plans to have one day maybe something built beside it. That's just kind of to go a little bit back and starting with needs. And as Vita already showed, most of the programs and the social programs take place outside of the house and um, engages in conversations that are important for our, you know, for our society. It's not uh, just about art and architecture, it's about issues, engaging into issues that are um, interesting and again, important. And then I start here because Alvaro Siza, so I have to go a little bit um, back to this gentleman because as some of you know, Alvaro Siza is a Portuguese architect who is extremely um, passionate about Bauhaus and Miss van der Rohe. And I had the great privilege to work with Alvaro Siza 2019. It was 100 year Bauhaus. I worked on an exhibition at the Museum for Architectural Drawings with his work. And Alvaro Siza asked me to show him my favorite building and I took him to House Lemke because at that time I was very lucky to work on an exhibition at the House Lemke showing the work of the artist Ilya Kabakov. So Alvaro Siza goes to the Miss Van der Rohe house. He'd never been there. He's absolutely admiring Mies his whole life and was quite inspired by him. Um, he stands in the garden and we casually ask him, like, uh, gentlemen, pardon, I have some technical problem. So we ask him, Alvaro, if you had an idea to build a new building on the premises of, um, beside uh, Miss Van der Rohe, what will you do? And Alvaro had his cigarette in his mouth, he grabbed the sketchbook and he just sketched an idea. And for me, that was an interesting approach. We asked him in a casual manner and he just drafted us an idea of what he envisioned could fit in a dialogue with a historical landmark. That gave me an opportunity to think about this project further. What, why don't we just continue doing that? Why don't we invite architects, artists, architectural historians, and ask them about their ideas and their engagement? How can a new building with new expectations exist beside historical landmark? Um, and I'm gonna play you this short video that sums it up because the project has been going for two years. I don't wanna um, take too much of your time. What is this technical? Here we go. The future of the Miss van der Rohe House in Berlin, known as the Lemke House, has been part of an ongoing conversation initiated by the director Vita Noack and supported by the chairman of the board Ingolf Kahn. Due to the big visitor flow, the historical structure needs to be relieved and a visitor center accommodating all important functions is much needed. Over the years, this conversation received numerous support and exchange of ideas. The Portuguese architect Alvaro Siza created a sketch as an impulse during his visit in February 2019. Last year, the film and exhibition project Nisco's Future was launched consisting of a digital forum and selected exhibition, including the German artist Katrin Günther, the US American artist Alex Schwerer, the Brazilian artist Isabel Borges, and the Russian-German artist and architect Sergei Choban. The Swiss architect Peter Mati sketched his ideas for a new building. The German architect Jörn Köppler talked about his drawing for the extension building. The British architect David Chipperfield shared his view after renovating the Neue National Gallery in Berlin. The French architect Odile Deck spoke about new buildings adjacent to modernist architectural monuments. 
The German art historian Jan Marun discussed Miss van der Rohe's project shown at the building exhibition in Berlin in 1931. The Spanish architect and the director of Fundación Miss van der Rohe in Barcelona, Ana Ramos, talked about how the future of the legacy of Miss van der Rohe can be shared among the sister institutions. The French architectural historian Jean-Louis Cohn talked about a companion building next to the Lemke House. The German architectural theoretician Fritz Neumeyer, as well as the German architectural historian Andres Lepic, expressed their support for the new building as well. The Swiss architect Martino Stierli, the Philip Johnson chief curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, finds that a new building for the Lemke House is meaningful and important. This year we will continue this conversation with international protagonists and with this message we hope to get your ideas, comments and hopefully sketches and drawings of how you can envision a new building beside a historical landmark. You can send your ideas to the Miss van der Rohe House in Berlin directly or by email. You saw here is a small selection of all the protagonists that participated in the first year and a half. Um, it was a lot of footage. We actually made a documentary film of, that was 60 minutes long that we showed September 5th. And this feature we made, um, as you saw, it called Message to Architect. And as you saw, a lot of protagonists in this film were established or older um, or successful and well-known uh, protagonists. And of course, the question is, well, if you look for the future, why not um, invite young architects? And once we had the platform with great names, great voices, we sent out this message um, to all online platforms like Arc Daily, Still World, and Berlin Art Link to reach out to young audience, to young architects. Um, and they start sending us drawings and their sketches and their ideas that, of course, for us, in order to move this project again in the future, we needed to hear their voices too. And I prepared just a small selection of the drawings and ideas we received that I'm gonna show you. It's just simple as that. Um, a student had this idea how he envisions a new building existing beside the historical landmark. And I'd like to use the term companion that Jean-Louis Cohen coined for this project a companion beside the House Lemke because he thinks it's very fragile, so it needs a companion, which I like. And then we have simple ideas, um, again like this, very simple sketches, very Caesar-like. And then we have something a little bit more. Obviously, is very inspired. Um, so, again, there was a, quite a few uh, messages we received, quite a few ideas, and our hope one day is that we have enough interesting material to have an exhibition or perhaps include it in the publication. 
Again, um, this is a project that is designed as a long-term study. Um, we're go, gonna continue next year as well. This year we still um, film in Chicago. We will film Scott Mihavi, who is the director of the Farnsworth House. We will, of course, talk to the grandson of Ms. van der Rooy, Dirk Lohan. We have a project where we will film um, an architect, Regine Leibinger. She did um, interesting in her seminar, she did with students from Harvard, a project that was very much about the ideas for the new building besides the House Lemke. We would like to see those ideas as well in this dialogue, in this future concept. And I'm showing you here um, just a few snippets from the film feature or the documentary screening we did on 5th of September where all of those protagonists and their participation were put in one feature. We, we also invited um, an, art, an co composer from Los Angeles to write a score who was very inspired by the architecture and the protagonists. And that's something, um, you know, what I'm trying to share with you here that for us, for us um, to move closer to realize something so evident, so important for the society, you have to try to really reach out a broad spectrum and really listen to all the voices. You can see in this short um, introduction, we talked to architects that not only, you know, were big fans like Caesar of modern architecture, or Dildek, for instance, is absolutely not modern architecture type of an architect, yet she doesn't believe that historical landmarks should be treated like monuments. They should be used in a, you know, in a contemporary way. So our goal is that with this project, we will continue inviting um, young people, young architects, hearing the voices, all with the hope and aim that we can convince um, the bureaucratic department of historical landmark in Berlin to allow us to open an open competition and hopefully um, come closer to our hope for a new building. Thank you. Have the mic? Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Senilla. We are super ahead of time. But um, um, my question to you three, our guests, Margarita, Joachim, and Isabel, is if you have time to give one advice to your colleague, Wita. Okay? That's what I will ask you. Un consiglio per Wita. One. But my question to Wita is, while you think of your answer, my question to Wita is, have you considered about n having an extension that doesn't mean a new construction? Have you done any research about the surrounding buildings and the possibility to reuse some of the neighbor buildings instead of building something new? Uh, yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of both and both intellect. Yeah. Okay. You want to use this thing also? Okay. The Umgebung. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Umgebung uh, vom Haus is interessant. We have uns die auch angeguckt. The area around the house. I'm going to translate. Um, really, really quick. Can you use your mic? Yeah. Hello. The area around uh, House Lemke is quite interesting. It's quite, quite versatile. Um, weil um, das ursprünglich eine Landhaussiedlung war. This should be a landhouse um, environment. And man kann von Grundstück zu Grundstück um, sind Villen angelegt. Also das ist regelmäßig parzelliert und das sind eigentlich ein bis zwei geschossige Villen an diesem Part, wo das Mies van der Rohe in der Mitte sich uh, befindet. Around House Lemke, there's a lot of villas that are situated quite proportion-wise from each other, and they have nice villas. So it's a, yeah, it's a very nice and green area along, um, or, uh, along the lake. In, insofern finde ich deine Frage sehr interessant, weil uh, sozusagen man könnte eigentlich dieses, diese traditionelle Idee von Landhaus und Villa aufnehmen 
und sozusagen eine Idee sozusagen des Besucherservice Center wie ein, wie ein, so tun, als sei es eine weitere Villa. Yes, so Vita, um, as Wilson finds the question very interesting, because if you look at the layout, um, the Landhaus can easily be associated with the villa and come in the dialogue for, you know, in the future for the program. Um, auf der anderen Seite, um, das Haus Lemke ist selbst in der Umgebung um, ganz klein. Die uh, Häuser auch im Hintergrund sind um, mehrgeschossig. Es ist klein und es war nun gerade der Trick von Mies van der Rohe, uh, in dieser heterogenen Umgebung ein... Um, ein, 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 ein ähm, Haus hinzusetzen, was sich sozusagen eigentlich nach außen abschottet und so tut, als sei es ein Rückzugshaus. Wir diskutieren ja das Haus auch im Mieswerk als Rückzugshaus. Äh, wir haben die 30er Jahre, das muss man auch noch in Anschlag nehmen. On the other hand, the Haus Lemke is quite unique in its way. It's, um, the way Mies van der Rohe designed it, it's, very, it's a very simple layout, it's a you know, L-shaped design, so it doesn't really, you know, it stands in contrast, and at the same time, it's um, very uniquely proportioned the way Mies envisioned. I think, I think we're good. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, good, we'll continue that discussion. <laughs> But the most important thing to be done is, is to think what therapy do you want to give? And what therapy are you going to ask? Yes, Joachim. I felt very inspired. I know, of course, the project um, yes. in Berlin very good. So, but I felt very inspired what you said about yes. integrating um, the people directly living a, around your museum, especially in your case, where there had been big discussions in the 90s when Richard Meyer built that with these high walls. I remember that big discussions, is it the right way to create that separation? And this is still then our problem with the museum. How could we get a connection between all these people around? I just saw it today, there are skaters, and then the museum told me they're not coming in the same we have we in our museum. There are skaters around that they don't get in. So it's two worlds, actually. You have, you're offering a plaza, but it's not the visitors you have inside. And in the question now, coming back to the Mies House, um, the, I, I know all these situations and you showed images of that, that you have a lot of visitors and, and if it's wet and in Germany there's much more rain than in this country. Um, so the people you need, all these kind of uh, technical things, then you, you have your office still in the original building. So the one question would be what are the functions we really would need? And then I find your, your question quite good. Um, yeah. One can also think about what has to be on the ground and what could be in a building next door. Mm -hmm. Maybe your office um, or the offices could be next door. But other things like the Centre Pompidou, um, the whole Centre Pompidou, the offices for that museum are across the street. They're not in the building and it's a wonderful functioning yeah. museum. So that can work. Um, <laughs> okay, um, but I'm just saying, um, <laughs> If, if you say no, then we ha then then one gets back to this to this uh, to this ground, and um, and then to this question how to react uh, to the garden and the Mies building. And still, it's a, as you said, it's a, these are two original or two grounds, so one could use one ground to build something. But um, I would be interested um, in your visitors and like who is coming, um, what do they really need. And maybe it could be very simple. Yes. Would be my suggestion. Good. <laughs> no replica. <laughs> no replica because uh, adesso um, Margherita, prego, della sua esperienza. 
cosa puoi dire a Rita? Allora, io credo, come è stato detto, che è molto importante il processo. I think as it's been said, it's a very important um, process in this <coughs> sorry, it's a very important process of participation of the people of the city, the residents, and it's an important moment. We have to take into account the identity of the city and therefore who is in charge of designing the program and uh, the whole design. So once you've done the historical research and you have come to the motivations and the solutions and the ideas that have been generated by this iconic building, I only see one solution, one pathway, which is an international competition. The only solution will be brought about by a project, and the only way to get a project is through an international competition, where you put different ideas competing against each other, and you come up with one. May I add something? Is that, is that okay? Can I add something? solo che nella storia dell'architettura è sempre stato così ed il metodo in genere ha funzionato. In the field I hardly heard her, but in the field of architecture it's always been like that and it's an efficient method that has been proven right. Um, what the three of you have in common that your institution is placed in the center in the heart of the city. It pulsates through the people around it through through the visitors, through the noises. You know, the museum is the people because it's the way it's located. So its geography plays a big role. In the case of um, the House Lemke, it is quite far to get to. It becomes a journey. It's something you can compare to Villa Savoie, perhaps in Pussy. Yeah, it's, it's quite, um, it's a, you know, it's, it's in a remote area, so you really want to go there. So one thing um, is always goes to the mind, how can we be a satellite to a big institution? Um, what, what, what can be done? So all those, this is a big difference, I think, in, in this case, just the location. And you know, geography in architecture is the key. So maybe the question is, if you, why the people is going to come? Well, I, I wanted to just ask you one thing because you were saying that having the office across the street could be a possibility, but to which extent can uh, you think about extensions in other parts of the city? So P P2P, you know, the MoMA, for example, city center in Manhattan, but it has obviously the use of that part of the museum is totally different, okay? But to which extent have you, did it come to your minds at all that these extensions could be somewhere else, and that you could have satellites, and therefore the whole city could be revitalized. Ich würde gerne um, noch mal auf den Punkt eingehen, den Joachim gesagt hat, oder die Frage, ob man das vielleicht auch gegenüber oder woanders in der Nähe machen kann. Und da, ich glaube, Anna, da, da wirst du das genauso fühlen wie ich, dass sozusagen diese Mies-Orte besondere Orte sind. Woanders ist woanders. Die, der Spirit dieses Mies-Ortes, also da sind wir uns auch einig, das hat auch Fritz Neumeier noch mal sehr betont, dass sozusagen das sozusagen so viel Potenzial ist und so viel aus, an, an diesem kleinen Ort entsteht, hat mit mies van der Rohe zu tun. Also das ist der Spirit des Ortes und den kann man nicht woanders hin transferieren. Und so viel nur zu deinem, wie, zu dem Nein. Wie, let me just translate so audience is involved. Um, so Vita was just commenting that in her view it's very hard for her to envision the office being in a neighbor house, lock it in a neighbor house, because for her the essence of Mies itself is in the building. And, and the atmosphere, so, so yeah, the space is, um, you know, you have to be loyal to the space. That's in her view is, um, you know, not something that she can envision. And she agrees with Anna, I guess. Ivan and I and all our team, we can understand what you're talking about because our offices are about three or four, three kilometers away from here. So <laughs> that's interesting. Well. Our goal here was to open a conversation. I think the conversation is open. You are all invited to continue with a bottle of beer outside. And for the next year, while the Mies Goes Future project is going on. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.